Am I good? You're good. Okay. Hello, welcome to my ISM presentation. My name is Eliza Kenyon, and I just wanted to start my presentation with telling you a little bit about myself. So I'm a junior at Frisco High School. I have a twin sister named Morgan. I'm in band. I play the euphonium, and I'm the euphonium section leader. I'm learning Spanish in school, and I'm learning Russian outside of school. And I also really enjoy traveling. And because I really enjoy traveling, and I really enjoy learning languages, I decided that this year in ISM, I wanted to study international relations. International relations is a branch of political science that basically deals with making sure countries get along with each other. And typical career tracks are with the Department of State, but you can also work with the UN or in the private sector. There's a lot of different jobs because it's a very broad field. Um, however, I was most interested in the Department of State after doing some research. And as part of the ISM program, we do a lot of research assessments. So one of them I did was over different careers in the Department of State. And what I learned was that there are five main tracks in the Department of State. The first one is consular officer, and that's people that deal with immigration matters, uh, visas, and all those kinds of things. And then the second is economic officers, and they work with businesses and look for places where an American business would do well overseas. The management officers run the embassies, and they also manage real estate that's in the foreign country. Political officer, which I thought sounded most interesting, is people who advise the government, uh, the U.S. government, on the best action to take in a foreign country based on observations and what they have learned while being stationed overseas. And then the last one is public diplomacy officer and that's just working with the media to make sure that America is portrayed in a good light. And after doing these research assessments I decided that it would be important to do one over cultural communications because that seems to be the most important thing uh, in international relations and that's actually what basically everybody I interviewed told me as well is that you have to understand how to communicate especially with people who have different values and come from different backgrounds. And then I just found the six main things about communicating with other cultures. The first is verbal and nonverbal communication which verbal is how you speak and nonverbal is basically just how you portray yourself and your posture, your gestures and all those kinds of things. And then conflict solving do people like solving conflicts out in the open or do they like to keep it between the two parties that are having the issue? Uh, completing tasks is do people like to look ahead for what they want to do or do they like to look to the past? And then decision making, who makes the decisions? Is it more of a democratic operation or is it one person? Disclosure is really important in some countries, especially in South America. They really enjoy getting to know all about you and your family and your personal life. But in other countries like China, they just want to stick to business. So you need to make sure that you know the difference between those before going and trying to do business. And then the last one's validating knowledge. And that one kind of goes with completing tasks. Do you want to look to the past or look to the future for what could be an improvement over the normal way? And so along with these research assessments, I interviewed, I interviewed five individuals before picking a mentor, and then I have six people on the list. The last person is somebody I interviewed more recently, but I thought I would include him on the list because he gave me a lot of good information. The first person I interviewed was Katrina Moore, and she works, she's an immigration lawyer for Coles and Thompson, and she also interned with the Department of State during college, which was very interesting to hear about, and she said she really enjoyed her time there. Uh, the second person I interviewed was Jim Falk, and he works for the World Affairs Council of Dallas, and he's also the honorary consulate of Morocco, which was really interesting. Personally, that was not my best interview because I don't think I was as prepared, but it taught me a lot about being more prepared, and I learned a lot from him. Uh, the third person I interviewed was Mark Gillette, and he works for Cornerstone Automation Systems, which is a company here in Frisco. And he actually does more of the business side of things as opposed to working internationally. But I got to still hear about kind of a different perspective, which was very interesting. The fourth person I spoke with was Lauren West. And he has his own trading company with his son. It's kind of a family business. It's called West Global Trading. And they actually do more of brokerage than trading. But uh, he really enjoyed his job, too, and gave me a lot of good advice. Uh, the last person I interviewed before picking a mentor was Bradley Shogren. And he currently works for a medical company, but he previously worked in Russia with his brother, and they had a chain of businesses that were actually very successful, but they tried to start a cattle farm in Siberia, and it did not work out well because they did not invest properly or something, and they ended up losing a lot of their money. Um, 
But so he ended up going into a new job. He wanted to go to a more stable job in the U.S. for now. His brother's still in Russia, though, and it was just really inter my bad. interesting because I got to hear from somebody who'd worked in Russia, and I'm really interested in Russia. So, And then the last person I interviewed recently was Harry Whalen, and he works for the Frisco Economic Development Corporation, and he's kind of trying to get international businesses to come into Frisco, and he was very knowledgeable, and he gave me a lot of really great information, and he actually made a suggestion for my presentation that I'll show you later at the end. And then one thing I wanted to point out as well was that Katrina Moore, Mark Gillette, Lauren West, and Harry Whalen are all on the Frisco International Business Council, which is really interesting. And another thing I wanted to point out was that out of all the people I interviewed, they all had very different jobs, which kind of shows how broad of a field international relations is. So for my mentor, I ended up choosing Katrina Moore because she was really interesting and she was really funny as well. And she had that experience with the Department of State that I was interested in learning more about. And she, at the time, she was actually resigning from her job because they were making her work too crazy of hours and she had a family to, so that she had to balance. And so, but she offered me the opportunity to come and intern with the Frisco Chamber of Commerce International Business Council and work with a lot of the people there. And I said yes because it sounded really interesting. And basically what I've been doing is I've been attending their meetings and then working on some of the projects that, with them. And I'll talk more about those because they kind of tie into my final product. So I'll talk more about those when I get there. But most of my mentor visits have been going to IBC meetings. They just happen once a month. And then when I'm not going to IBC meetings, I just meet with my mentor to discuss my product. And I've occasionally met with other people in the IBC, like Harry Whalen and the <coughs> chair named Debbie Ames, to work on different projects. So what I discovered so far kind of at the in the first semester was that international relations was a very broad field and it covers a lot of different job areas as I discussed earlier nobody that I talked to had a similar job but everybody seemed to really enjoy it so that was very encouraging and then what I realized is I've gotten a lot better at communicating with strangers and adults which I guess doesn't sound like a good thing but it is and which is really nice. Um, my mentor actually told me the other day that I'd come a long way from where I'd been when she, I first interviewed her, which was nice to hear. And then I just need to work on being more sociable and assertive because I'm more of an introvert and I need to work on being able to get out there more if I want to do well in this area. So for my original work, I'm interested in Russia, obviously, because I'm learning the language. I just think it's a cool country. I just like how they were kind of our rivals uh, at one point, they still kind of are. And I just wanted to do a really fun project for my original work. So I decided that I would just try to solve the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So I did a lot of research on the topic. Uh, at my last presentation, I had a giant binder that I showed everyone um, full of research. And then I learned how to write a formal agreement. And I looked at real peace agreements and things that had been made. And I tried to make mine look like that. And so just before, I, I wanted to read you some of my, part of my solution to the crisis, but I kind of wanted to offer like a background on it first. So basically it all started when the former ruler of Ukraine, his name was Viktor Yanakovych, and he was thrown out of office, which ironically, this is the second time he's been thrown out of office. He was thrown out of office during the Orange Revolution, um, and then they ended up re-electing him some time later, which didn't really make sense. And then they threw him out again this time because he signed a deal that aligned more with Russia than with the EU and Western Europe. And a lot of people in the Ukraine were very upset about that because they, like, they want to align with Western Europe as opposed to Russia, but he's kind of more of a pro-Russia guy. So they ended up throwing him out of office, and he ended up moving to Russia, I think, because they were going to keep him safe. And at that time, Russia started kind of going into Crimea because they were kind of upset that they had just randomly thrown out their leader who had just signed a deal with them. So they went into Crimea and then of course they held that really unfair referendum vote where Crimea ended up being annexed to Russia and now it's just been a big issue because there's just been a lot of rebel groups going in and out, possibly Russians even though they deny it. Uh, so it's just a big issue right now. And so I just wanted to talk about part of my solution. The first one would be regarding NATO, which was another kind of cause of the whole issue. NATO was 
founded during the Cold War era to combat kind of Russia, Russian expansionism. It was kind of the, um, it was the rival to the Warsaw Pact, kind of. And so it was an, it's an anti-Russian thing. It's an anti-Russian entity. So Russia doesn't really want it expanding to their borders, and they've told NATO that many times, and, but NATO has still been expanding. Uh, the interesting thing is that back in the day when the, uh, when the Soviet Union had just fallen, we kind of tricked Russia into believing that NATO wouldn't <coughs> expand further into their territory so that we could get something from them in exchange. And so we were really proud of ourselves because we tricked Russia, but it ended up coming back to hurt us now. Um, so we've been expanding NATO to a lot of border countries in Russia, and, that's, and we were thinking of adding Ukraine to NATO, which would maybe be another issue of why <coughs> Russia invaded Ukraine. So regarding NATO, I think that expansion to any countries bordering Russia should not happen anymore. There are already some like little Baltic states that border Russia that are members of NATO, but they're really small and they've already joined, so I don't think I think they should stay in, but NATO needs to stop expanding in the future and listen to what Russia has to say. And then regarding the EU, the Ukraine also or the U Ukraine also wants to join the European European Union. And Russia isn't a big fan of that because they want Ukraine to be their economic partner, not Western Europe's. And I think the decision to join the EU should be left up to Ukraine since we're already restricting NATO. But they need to realize that Russia is a, their stronger neighbor, neighbor and, <coughs> and they need to make sure that they know that Russia will be upset and might possibly take action against them if they join the EU. And then regarding Crimea, which is a big issue. Uh, Crimea was actually originally part of Russia, <coughs> but during the Cold War, uh, Nikita Khrushchev gave it away to the Ukraine just randomly one day. He, one day he was just like, I'm giving Crimea to the Ukraine because I grew up there and I liked it there, so I'm just giving them Crimea. And nobody really had a say against him, so <coughs> it ended up going to the Ukraine, even though most of the majority of people there were ethnically Russian, which created issues later on, obviously, as many people there now feel more part of Russia, but a lot of them still want to stay in the Ukraine. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> So regarding Crimea, I was thinking that they should hold a fair vote this time to see if Crimea should stay in the Ukraine or join Russia, because it was originally part of Russia, so there's a big ethnic majority, so we can't just give it back to Ukraine. That might create issues in the future. But um, uh, we can't just give it back to Russia either, because it was part of the Ukraine for a while. So that was my deal on Crimea. And then <coughs> regarding Eastern and Western regional differences in the Ukraine, in the Ukraine, if you look at their elections, <coughs> you'll see that there's a really big split um, in the East for Russian candidates, pro-Russian candidates, and in the West for pro-European candidates. And so I think that the West and the East both need to stay out of Russian politics because I know that the U.S. funds certain candidates and or in the Ukrainian politics. They fund certain Ukrainian candidates, and I know Russia probably funds some Eastern Ukrainian candidates that'll align more with them. So I think that everyone should just kind of stay out for Ukraine for a while and give them time to kind of look inward and unite against all this different tensions that they have so that they can be a stronger country that's focused more on themselves than on aligning with a certain power. And then I just wanted to make a couple, two or three more points. One was um, regarding social issues in Ukraine. In the Ukraine, they don't respect the minorities as much, with, which is like the Russians and the Tatars, which are like a, kind of like a Muslim group that were kind of thrown out and mistreated a lot. And so I think Russians should become an official language, uh, official language, and they should also make sure that they respect all the minorities. And then regarding the invasion of Russia, they definitely need to apologize, or the invasion of Ukraine, 
Um, Russia definitely needs to apologize to the Ukraine for taking over their territory, and they probably need to get out of Ukraine. Um, um, and then they need to figure out the whole Crimea deal as soon as possible. So that was part of my original work. I also did an analysis over my paper that explained my points more in depth. Um, the original work was great though because it taught me some really good time management skills and I also learned how to do a really solid research and I enjoyed it which was nice as well. And my original work I also really enjoyed it because it could solve a real issue and I just had a lot of fun putting it together. So for my final product I've been working with the Frisco Chamber of Commerce International Business Council and I helped them first we cleaned up a database that they had obtained from doing a survey of businesses in the area that might have wanted to do international business in the future or that were currently doing international business. So we got the database and it's apparently their first database ever even though they've been in existence for a couple of years. And so we cleaned that up and then for the, we're going to be using the database to send out a newsletter to different to all the businesses that replied yes they want to do international business we'll be sending them a newsletter about the International Business Council and opportunities and they, they would have to connect and so I'm helping put together the newsletter which can be seen on the right of this slide and I'm also it, that's just part of it um, it's just a picture of part of it and then I'm gonna be writing an article that'll go out in the newsletter soon and then I'll also be helping out at an event that we're having next week that my mentor helps put together. It's called the Brown Bag Lunch, and it's basically where different business people can come together, and they bring like a lunch, but they are going to learn uh, different languages. And for the next three, two or three weeks, it's going to be Mandarin Chinese. So that'll be really helpful for different businesses. And I'm just going to be there to help facilitate the event and maybe answer some questions. And she's going to give them all a copy of the newsletter so they know more about the International Business Council. And then. I will also be writing a research paper that has to deal with the demographics in Frisco and cover topics such as how many uh, foreign language students we have in Frisco ISD and kind of like the diversity makeup the, and then just other topics that go into demographics and international businesses and in Frisco there's only actually three like big international businesses in Frisco and one's actually leaving in June so that's actually why they hired Harry Whalen, who I spoke about earlier to try to get more international businesses interested in Frisco. And he actually gave me a lot of information, which I talked about previously when I interviewed him over my research information. Uh, my article for the newsletter is about cultural communication and the importance of understanding different cultures when doing international business. And he actually gave me a couple of books on doing business with like different countries such as Japan and India that were really helpful. And then for my research paper, he gave me a lot of information on Frisco and investors that are coming in from international uh, companies and just different things that's, that are going on in Frisco right now. And so he was actually a big help. And then uh, he asked me actually like a question when I was there. He asked me what I thought the most important language to know was when working with and when working internationally. And does anybody know when I answer? No. Oh, not quite. He actually said the most important language to know when working with an international, working internationally, is the language of the person you're doing business with. So they're all right, but it's like important to know who you're working with. And so, <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a trick question. <laughs> um, but he was actually pretty impressed because I guessed it right. And I was like, whew. But, um, <laughs> but he wanted me to include this video in my presentation. He thought it'd be kind of a funny way to showcase how important it is if you're doing a job internationally, you need to be able to understand the different languages of the people that you could possibly be working with. So this is just kind of like a funny short clip that showcases the importance of understanding different languages and cultures. Oh, can we turn it up? Wichtigste Skill hinter Skills ist das Skill und das Überlebensradar.
This is the German Coast Guard. We are thinking, we are thinking. What are you thinking about? So that video just kind of shows, it's kind of a funny way to show that you need to understand different people, especially languages, if you're going to work internationally. So reflections from this year, what I've learned this year is that you, I've learned a lot of business skills and how to behave in professional business environments, and I've learned that I need to be more outgoing definitely when meeting professionals, and I've learned a lot about international relations, uh, about how it's such a broad field and about different areas of it and what's expected of you if you go into that field. For next year, I'm going to be at Frisco again, yay, um, and I'm going to be a senior <laughs> and I'm going to be in ISM again, so that'll be really fun. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to study the same thing or something different yet, um, but I have the summer to decide, thankfully. And then for college plans, i um, not really quite sure yet where I want to go, but I've definitely been looking into it and am excited to when I will finally leave Frisco. Um, <laughs> no, it's actually not that bad. Um, career goals and life goals. Uh, basically, I just want to have a career that I really have fun with, and I want to do something that's nice, that does pay decently, but I also just, the most important thing is to enjoy my career, and I kind of want an adventurous career that's more fun and not like the daily nine to five or anything. And that's also why I was interested in international relations, because you get to travel everywhere, and it's a very different job depending on where you are. And it just seems like it'd be a fun career to have. So I just wanted to end with my quote, even though usually you would start with it. I just like ending with it. And my quote for ISN this year was, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. And it's by Thomas Edison. And I think it really outlines or highlights my year of ISM. Or, and because even though things were difficult and I didn't always like talking to new people and having to do all the interviews, I just kept going and it ended up being very rewarding in the end and I'm looking forward to doing it next year. And I also like this quote because I think it really applies to not just my ISM year but in life if you uh, have a struggle or something difficult happening in your life, you need to just keep pushing forwards so that you can do the best you can in your life and it'll be more rewarding in the end if it's difficult. So thank you for coming to my presentation.